Welcome to the Queer Spirit Podcast. I'm your host, Nick Venagoni. Here we have conversations with artists, healers, and activists who enliven the LGBTQ communities and who empower our queer spirits to flourish. Today, my guest is Christian De La Huerta. Christian has been a writer, speaker, and group facilitator for over 25 years. He is the author of the award-winning and critically acclaimed Coming Out Spiritually, and he is currently working on a new book, Calling All Heroes. Christian is the creator and teacher of several self-development programs focusing on personal growth and awareness, advanced transformational practices, understanding sex and relationships, mechanisms of ego and projection, life purpose, and reclaiming personal power. Today, we talk about how breathwork changed Christian's life and how he guides others to use it for deep transformational work. He also shares his ideas about how queer people are catalysts for our planet's spiritual evolution. Find out more about Christian, his work, and his offerings at soulfulpower.com. Hi, Christian. Welcome to the show. Hey, Nick. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate being here. So Christian, you do a lot of different things in your work in the world as primarily as a teacher and a facilitator. And I wonder if you could start us by giving us the story about how you first came to this work. Well, I have a degree in psychology. My father was a psychiatrist, so I come out of the psychotherapy tradition, was on a track to get a PhD. And then as I was approaching my 30s, I went through kind of like a mini life crisis, wondering, questioning, you know, what I was going to do with the rest of it and getting clear about what I wanted to do for my life. In one of those synchronistic turn of events, I found out about um, this body of work that introduced me to, among other things, breath work and changed my life. My very first session just took my life in a different direction. I never went for the PhD and having doing and offering breath work for the last 30 years now all over the world. I'm curious to know what some of your initial insights were when you had your first breath work session were, because I've experienced that myself and I know it can be a profound experience. Well, God, there's so many. I mean, from deeper insights about myself and my role in the universe. So, you know, having been on a spiritual path and had experiences of read about experiences of oneness and the interconnectedness of it all was one thing, but experiencing it in my body was a whole different level of it. And part of the reason that I was just so impressed by and felt that the need to ought to not only do it myself again, but to make it available to others was just how quickly it heals. And I've yet to come across anything that heals as profoundly, as quickly, and in as many different levels as it does. And the beauty of it is how simple it is. And I know it sounds too good to be true. But, you know, I can't argue with 30 years of results. Like, it works. It works. And with permanent effect, lives change. And for the people who don't know what we're talking about, can you explain a little bit about what breathwork is and how it works? Yeah, there are different modalities. So breathwork is kind of the more generic term or umbrella term. It's a breathing practice. You breathe in a certain way. Most of them are a circular, connected way. For an hour and a half, an hour, some modalities go longer, three or four hours, and amazing stuff happens. Like I was starting to say, not only does it heal emotionally and psychologically and mentally, but it heals spiritually, and people have profound spiritual inexplicable connections and and experiences, and it heals even physically. And I know that's the part that sounds too good to be true, but it works. Mm -hmm. It's amazing what happens when you flood the body with oxygen. Yeah, definitely. And with prana, you know, with the universal intelligence. And what's interesting about that, like if I were going to start finding reasons to help people understand how it works, because ultimately I don't think there's an explanation as to how it works. I think it's, ultimately a spiritual practice. And that's the kind of experience that our minds just cannot explain. We look at all the different spiritual traditions in the world and and even some secular languages, the word for spirit and breath is the same. So the same word can be interpreted or can be translated to mean spirit or breath, depending on context, depending on what we're talking about. And are there particular styles or traditions that you use in your 
sessions yes. with people? Yes, I call my modality soulful breathwork, but I was trained as a rebirther. And so initially when they discovered it in the West, in the Bay Area, in the 70s, I think it was, and discovered in quotes because it's a yogic breathing practice. So it's been done in the East, but it was discovered independently by a guy in the Bay Area who was in a hot tub and playing with his breath and had this amazing expanded you know, state of awareness. So initially they started in hot tubs and then it was brought out to do on the floor and on mats and blankets as mostly done these days. Mm -hmm. Okay. And one of the things that you write about is that you want to help people tap into their soulful power. And I'm wondering what soulful power is to you. Yeah. And that's a great question. That's what I've been writing about and researching uh, for the last probably five, six years. And I'll tell you how I came about that. I was sitting in meditation one day and, you know, most of the time, like for most people, meditation is kind of boring, you know, where you're just sitting there watching your breath and having a thought or going off to do a to-do list and then, you know, reeling yourself back and only for the second time. Now it's happened three times, but this was the second time I actually heard audible words. And the first time was coming out spiritually, which I thought was a conference, turned out to be a book. When I was approached by a publisher from New York to write a book on gay or queer or LGBT spirituality, this other time was The Soul of Power. And I thought, oh, that's cool. And got up from meditation and got the URL, forgot about it. And a few months later, I, was, had been, I had submitted another proposal to a literary agent that I was working with at the time in New York on a different subject. And she goes, great. I want to work with you, but I want to see some of these marketing plans in place before we pitch it to a publisher. And I don't know, do you ever seen a book proposal, but it's like a term paper that takes, you know, took me two, three months to put it together, it includes a marketing analysis, you know, what, who else is out there? What else is similar? Why are you the one to write this book? Who's your audience? How are you going to reach them? Blah, blah, blah. So after all that, she goes, you know, for me to implement those marketing ideas would have taken me a year. And so it was like, you know, putting on the brakes and screeching, coming to a screeching halt. And then I asked myself, all right, what would I, if I weren't writing for an advance, what would I really want to write about? And then it took me like three days to like live in that question. And then I thought, all right, it was like one of those, you know, moments, palm to the head, kind of to the face kind of moments. Like, all right, if I really believe that the single most important thing that needs to happen in the world is the empowerment of women, then what am I doing about that directly, specifically? And of course, I've always worked with women, but what am I doing about that specifically? And then I put together the solo power, women's empowerment, and it was like, wow, how do we do that? How do we step into power in a different way, into personal power? That is not hierarchical. That doesn't require me to push anybody down, to squelch them in order for me to prop myself up and feel powerful. And of course, it's for everybody, you know, male or female. I think we need to work this out, you know, because the way that we've been relating to power just hasn't worked and isn't working. And no wonder, as I've been doing retreats on that theme for the last few years, like, what most people tend to, what it tends to come up is that we're afraid of power. You know, we have this ambivalent, yes, no, kind of do this relationship with power because we're afraid of it. We're afraid that we might abuse it. And no wonder, you know, given all the abuses of power that we have witnessed and experienced all the time, and all we got to do is turn on the news on any given night, and there it is. So I've landed on... You know, that if we don't work this out for ourselves individually, personally, what we're risking is just a life of soul devouring mediocrity because of all the ways that we have sold out on our personal power because we feel that if we really were all of who we are, like if we really said all the bigness that's in us, that we will probably, you know, our relationships would come to an end and we would end up rejected and alone. So we stuff ourselves into little boxes and say yes, when in reality we mean no, because we hate confrontation and conflict. So we got to get this individually in terms of our personal fulfillment and personal expression, and also collectively, if we don't work this out, we're going to end up blowing each other up in the name of God, which is ironic, to say the least. So soulful power is a way of having a healthy connection to power and relationship to power as opposed to being afraid of it or 
abusing it or manipulating it. Yes. And figuring out ways of expressing it that are a match for us. So, you know, so for example, we tend what most of us tend to think of power, you know, which I call worldly power, the way that the world relates to it or, or egoic power. We get into a much more in-depth explanation of to what the ego is, which is also critical to understand if we want to be free, if we have, a, if we have any desire to break free from all of our conditioning and, and limitations and self-imposed prison that we have stuck ourselves in. So, but if we think about the way the world thinks of power, we tend to associate power with people who have money or they're famous or they have some, some political role or they are part of some hierarchy in a corporate structure or a religious organization. And all those things are fine, but they're external. So because they're external to us, they're fickle. You know, they're here today, gone tomorrow as opposed to the kind of power that I'm talking about, that I'm thinking about and writing about, which is the power that comes from within. And it's humble. It doesn't need to prove anything to anybody. So think of Gandhi or Gandalf, you know, in their simple robes and their sandal feet, and you wouldn't know until power is called for and necessary, and then watch out. You know, Gandhi brought the British Empire to its knees when it was at its highest point without lifting a gun. Or landing a punch. So that's what I'm talking about by soulful power. Yeah, I really relate to that. I work with a lot of my clients around their relationship to power. And a lot of people do have a fear of it because of the way that they've experienced abuse from other people or trauma. And, you know, they're afraid of being like the perpetrator. So they disown their power, they give it away. As a result, that's not helpful to them either. At what price? Because the only thing, the only relationships that we can have if we're not being fully authentic and fully in our power and fully expressing who we are, they can't be real. Our relationships cannot be authentic either if we're not showing mm -hmm. up authentically. So I know that you also work particularly with the LGBT community, and I'm curious how you've seen this work affect people, particularly from those communities. Well, it's interesting because I was just this morning, I received a, an acknowledgement on Facebook about somebody who read Coming Out Spiritually when it first came out 20 years ago this year. And just it was such a beautiful, heartfelt acknowledgement about how they had really changed their life. This is somebody who had been raised in one of the you know, mainline Christian denomination and had really struggled with trying to reconcile his sexual orientation, who he was, who he is authentically, and the religion of his birth. And, you know, that was my, what drove me to write that book too, is that I also went through that conflict. You know, I was raised very Catholic and in a very Catholic environment and trying to find a, a way for myself, even though I had this part of me that wanted to serve humanity, that wanted to serve the sacred, the divine God, if you would, as I understood it that. And yet being told by that same religion in which I was raised that that was abomination. And that I was going to burn in hell for eternity. It's like, wow, that was a bit of a mindfuck. Yeah, I can see how that's a perfect example of particularly queer people feeling afraid of stepping into their power because they have these experiences of organized religions that tell them that they're bad and wrong and sinners and going to hell, that they're manipulating their power in that way and they don't want to be like that. So they found right. their power. That's right. And then we've confused religion and spirituality. And no wonder, given, so we, many of us threw the baby out with the baptismal water because we didn't want any, anything to do with religion. No wonder. But well, what's, this is what coming out spiritually was about, is that what's ironic and tragic about that is that before the patriarchal times and cultures and religions, people that we today call LGBT, queer, whatever, were not only spiritually inclined, but were actually honored and revered for the roles of, of spiritual service that we played in cultures all over the world, in every inhabited continent. And, you know, so that's part of what I did in the book is give those names, those roles, and synthesize them, and then give examples throughout history. And they're amazing contributions that we have made. And I'm curious how you define spirituality separate from organized religion for people who might not yeah, to me, with all due respect, I honor them all and I challenge them all. And I don't belong to any one religion these days. I, you know, I'm fed by pieces of different traditions. But religion to me, the word itself, 
no, comes from the Latin religare, or which means to bind or to rebind. And to me, you know, that just feels kind of restrictive by definition to be you know, to be bounded by, to be limited. Whereas the word spirituality comes from spirare, you know, that the Latin root, which means both spirit and breath. And, you know, from which we get both respiration and inspiration or, or expiration. And so to me, spirituality is more that. It's about getting in touch with and giving expression to our innate essence. And I think it was Chardin, you know, Teilhard de Chardin, who said that we are spirits having a physical experience. And that's what it feels like to me, whether it's for one time or many times, depending on your system of belief. And like many of us, you know, LGBT people were rejected or tried to reject our sexuality. Many of us have also tried to reject their spirituality. Again, understandably, but it's just as, to me, it's just as ludicrous and impossible and unnecessary and tragic to try to reject one part of our humanity as it is to reject another. It's just part of who we are. So for me, spirituality is about finding, you know, a way of connecting with that. And it could be anything. There's just no dogma required or involved. It could be nature. And so what is it that when you're participating in that or in connection to that you feel a deeper sense of connectedness to yourself, to others, to something greater than yourself? What is it that gives you a sense of inner peace? You know, that's the kind of question that I would invite to somebody who was trying to find a way to, to connect with the spiritual tradition. Mm -hmm. And I imagine that's why you are so drawn to breath work because it does that so clearly and directly yeah. without religious yeah. binding any without even any mental involvement mm -hmm. and again so quickly and so efficient and so can be so ecstatic and pleasurable and so and again like the mind like i tell people sometimes when i'm giving them the intro about how to do it it bypasses the mind and so the mind could be sitting there as i hate this i will never do it again this guy is so crazy and this place is so weird and it still works and the beauty of that the reason that it's such a great adjunct to a therapy process and is that as you know the talk therapy part of it sometimes falls short because understanding up here what happened to us when we were seven or five or 15 or what didn't happen it's like it's a great okay i get it but sometimes it's not enough i would even say most times it's not enough because a lot of that trauma has been somaticized it's now stuck in the body in the tissues of the body and so the beauty of the breath is that it bypasses the mind and releases that trauma at a body level, at a cellular level, and people actually release that stuff. And I'm talking about serious trauma. I work with people who have been raped and sexually abused and all sorts of, you know, loss of kids, heavy duty stuff, and it gets healed. To me, it's a great adjective therapy because it's great also to have the understanding. And so when I do the retreats, it's that approach, you know, both the mental understanding, what happened, how does the mind work? How did that happen? What effect did it have? You know, when, whatever, when, when our parents got divorced at age seven and we made a choice that we would never, or where somebody cheated on us in early on life and we closed that heart and we still haven't resolve that so here we are with that desperate human need to have a, a longing for a connection or a relationship that can work and yet we walk around with a blocked heart which makes it impossible to have a relationship that can actually work so it's good to have the understanding but the real healing in my experience is with the breath work mm -hmm. yeah now another thing that you talk a lot about is queer people as catalysts for the planet's spiritual evolution what do you mean by that Yes. You know, it's part of what I did in Coming Out Spiritually is synthesize some of the roles that we have played throughout history. So catalysts for change, outsiders, you know, the sacred clowns, keepers of beauty, just different roles to organize the qualities. And that catalyst or the gatekeeper role is one that I got from the work of Maladoma Somme, who used to live in the Bay Area as well. I used to teach at CIIS, where I know you studied. And so in, he comes from the Dagora tribe in Africa. And in their tribe, they don't have a word for gay or queer or LGBT. But people that we would call, you know, those names have a special role 
in those tribes. Like they're considered to be like the mediators between this realm and other realms, which, and you see that in many other tribes, not just that. But what's interesting about Maladomo's work is that he was raised by Christian missionaries. And as a kid, teenager ran away and, and reconnected with his indigenous ways. And as an adult, he felt called to come to the West to share some of their wisdom and some of their teachings. And he says that part of the reason the world is in the shape that it's in is because the gatekeepers, you know, those who are the guardians to all the realities, to all the realms of reality, have been fired from their jobs. And so I found that as very significant. And it kind of turns what many traditions have been struggling with, you know, how to include LGBT people. When it's in reality, it's the other way around. It's like, what can we contribute? And you're missing out on our contributions. And so he does a retreat, by the way, where, for example, they have um, the closing ritual. They have out in the lawn, you know, they have this huge egg-shaped, drawn with ash kind of, you know, boundary. At the fat part of the egg, there's fire and there's drumming. And it goes on for hours until people kind of become... You know, kind of like they reach some kind of trance-like state. And then in the small part of the egg, there's a line going across that symbolizes the next world, the next realm. And so at some point when these people get moved into this trance, they go up, they're guided over to this ward, to this line, and some of them want to throw themselves over. And they, he chooses either two gay men or two lesbians to be the guardians at the gate. Sometimes they have to tackle people so that they don't jump over because in their system of belief, that would be dangerous, spiritually and even physically. And so when in the beginning of the weekend, he's asking for volunteers to be the, the gatekeepers, like everybody raises their hands. And he goes, no, no, sorry, you got to be gay or lesbian or LGBT. And it doesn't mean that we're better. It doesn't mean that we're worse. It just means that that's our job. And that these have been some of the many of the roles that we have played throughout history. Yeah. So I know that you do a workshop that's, and one in particular that's coming up in July called The Call for LGBT Heroes. And I wonder if this ties some of this in. Absolutely. There's two main teachings around that, which is so we talk about what it means to be a hero. Because for many of us, that word is a little, might be a little intimidating. Because we tend to think of heroism as somebody who accomplishes great feats. And, you know, often putting themselves at risk for this, you know, for the sake of another. And, you know, we don't have the time to get into it either, but the title of my next book that I'm finishing this year is, it's the call for heroes for everybody. So what does it mean to live heroically in the 21st century when we don't have the horse hitched outside and the armors and the demons to slay except the ones that are in here? So there's a whole set of teachings that go with that, you know, how does a hero navigate relationships consciously how do we step into into our power fully without you know in a non-hierarchical kind of how do i how does a hero live a life of meaning and purpose and particularly in the lgbt version of it we then the 10 archetypes that i wrote about and help people see these archetypes in themselves to own them to in many cases accept our spiritual natures people who have tried to reject it for decades in some cases and so it's very powerful to witness people reconnecting with themselves. And I know one example from last year, somebody who did that retreat at Esalen, and within a month he had quit his job that he hated and is now doing, you know, he got his life coach certification and is doing really, really meaningful work that is giving him a very empowered sense of fulfillment and purpose and also making a difference in many, many lives. That's great. Yeah. And then you have another workshop, Soulful Relationships. Do you want to share a little bit about that? Yeah, that's one of the most popular retreats that I do. And there's understandably, we all struggle with relationships. And so it's for everybody, you know, gay, straight, male, female, you know, single, coupled. So if you are in relationship and you've got those basic human needs for companionship, intimacy, sex, you know, in some cases, family, then what? How do you use the relationship intentionally to forward our own process of healing and awakening and evolution? Because sometimes I say that, that I think the Dalai Lama has it easy being celibate. And I did celibacy, you know, when I was in a natural for five years. And so I'm not putting it down. It was very empowering for me to do that for a year. And yet, 
you know, when I came out of that environment and got into my next relationship, I was like, whoa, I thought I was done with that. Because one thing is getting something, an understanding of behavioral pattern in the abstract. Another one is doing it in the push and pull of day-to-day relating. And, you know, so if you want to shine a light on those unhealed areas that are back here that we're never going to see, get in a relationship. We're so brilliant about finding and pushing each other's buttons. But if we do that consciously, rather than, you know, letting it go into attack or pushing, reacting and pushing one of theirs, one of their buttons. But if we do the work of figuring out what's going on and why does that bother me and what are my patterns, then it becomes a catalyst for healing. And it really speeds up that healing process. And if you're not in relationship and would like to be, how do we identify the subconscious patterns, the ways in which we block love and that we sabotage our relationships before we even get started in them by attracting the wrong people, people who are not available, people who are not a match. And so we look at, you know, just what's going on, like psychologically, what are we trying to protect in, by making sure that the relationship doesn't work out from the get-go. And then with the multiple breathwork sessions, we actually make possible the healing and the, and the release of those subconscious blocks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In my work with people, I notice that there are not to polarize things, but there can often be sort of two kinds of people who either hide from doing their personal work by being in relationship or they hide from doing their personal work by being single. Yeah. And so I'm always encouraging them, you know, especially the single people to try being in relationship and see what happens, what comes up, right? Exactly. So it sounds like you're really tackling that from both sides in this workshop, in this retreat. Yeah. Christian, can you share with us a person, practice, or experience who has supported your queer spirit to flourish? Well, you know, I'd have to say that if I were going to pick a single practice that has made a difference in my life, it's breathwork. It just made it real and healed stuff that I never even knew was in there. And then the other thing that was really instrumental, so, you know, I'm grateful for my former guru from whom I learned the ego. No, and how the ego mind works. And there's so much confusion about that in the world, and we don't have the time to get into that uh, here. But when I first understood what was meant by ego, and, and not in a Freudian sense, in the sense of Freud's model of personality, but more the Eastern concept of personality that makes us a sense of who we are. And so what I understood that and learned about that, I was like, wow, that's what I needed to know. With a combination between that and breath work, I felt like I had everything I needed to know to set myself, like to understand why I got stuck in this self-defeating, repetitive patterns of behavior, self-sabotaging, you know, acts and patterns, and then to have a tool through which to break the patterns and get free from them is like, wow, freedom. It was very liberating and life-changing. And so no matter what retreat I do, whether it's on relationships or personal empowerment or women's empowerment or the LGBT one or men's retreat or life purpose, there are two things I always do. One is a breath work because, again, I don't know anything that heals as quickly and as profoundly. And the second thing that I always do is teach the ego because that's when I first understood that it's like, wow, that's what I wish I would have gotten from my psychiatrist dad or from any psychology teacher that I studied with in college or from Jesuits, you know, that I studied with in high school. I didn't, I didn't understand what made me tick. So where can people find you to learn more about your work and your events? Thank you for asking that. My website, soulfulpower.com. I have an 800 number too, but most people don't. 777737557, but most people will go through the website. And so just to recap, you have Soulful Relationships coming up May 16th, and that is in Florida? In Miami. Mm -hmm. It's also offered in in different places. Like I teach retreats. I offer retreats in Colorado and California. I'll be back in California in November in the Bay Area, one on life purpose in Western Marin. So yeah, the, the best way to stay connected and informed is my website and get on my email list and You know, I take people to Hawaii, taking a group to Hawaii. I've taken groups to Machu Picchu and and the Sacred Valley in Peru, to Egypt and southern France. It's a combination of a hybrid between a retreat and a vacation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then the LGBT Heroes is in Esalen, which is just south of the Bay Area in California, July 19th. Yeah. Correct. I also offer that in Miami or the East Coast at a different time of the year. 
And you have weekly or regular breath groups in the Miami area too? I do. Well, not weekly because my travel schedule doesn't allow that, but at least every two weeks. Every two to three weeks I have one here. And I also do them in different parts of the country and have you know several people, many people who have trained with me. So again, if one of your listeners or viewers is interested, again, if they can reach me through my website, I can connect them with somebody closer to them. Okay, great. Well, I'll have all those links on the show notes for people to find as well. Thank you so much, Nick. Thank you for doing what you do. Yeah, thank you for being here. Do you feel lost or stuck? Or are you alone on your healing journey? If you're seeking guidance or support, I'm here to help. I offer online coaching and counseling for queer spiritual folks from all over. Schedule your free consultation with me now by going to QueerHealingJourneys.com. I look forward to supporting you on your path. To find the resources we discussed today, find the show notes at thequeerspirit.com. And if you enjoyed the show, remember to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. This will help us reach and support more queer people all over. Thanks for listening and see you next time. Bye.